Okay, I think last time we left off in uh, the Songs of Ascents in Psalm 120 through 134. And we, I've had a little break since the last time we recorded, so I'm not really sure what I said. But uh, we're, we're moving on from there. But I do want to go back and recap a couple of things. Uh, take this opportunity to look a little bit at the way we study the Bible and how we, we come up with uh, interpretation, translate, you know, tr interpretation of the scriptures. There's a Psalm, uh, Psalm 68, for example, and uh, there's parts of it that say stuff like this, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captive, captive thy captives. And some of you recognize this, quoted in the New Testament, Thou hast received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. And then it goes on to say something like this, verse 21 of Psalm 68, Surely God will shatter the head of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who goes on his... Go on, goes on in his guilty deeds. The Lord said, I will bring them back. Etc. He goes on, that your foot may shatter them in blood. The tongue of your dogs may have its portion from your enemies. All kinds of statements like this. And as I've looked at that in the past, a lot of times I go over that. And I think those just grandiose statements about God's power and his authority. There's another way that this can really be interpreted. And there's a, there's a theme through the Bible, which we talked about at the beginning, that this, this Bible is Christocentric. It's all about Jesus. The whole thing's about Christ. It's centered on Him. And there's one theme that runs throughout uh, from the very beginning to the end, and that is there will be a kingdom that God will set up and He will be king on the earth. And part of this, it, there's, there's over and over again, it talks about the end time scenario when the Lord actually returns, when He comes to the earth and establishes His kingdom. And we know that uh, there's prophecies in Isaiah and Micah and other, time, other uh, uh, books about his first coming, but there's, there's this theme about what we would call his second coming now that seems to run through this, that, that scriptures like Psalm 68 may actually be literal prophetic declarations of what's going to happen when the Lord returns as king. You know, and so that he's actually going to shatter heads you know, stomp out blood when you look at Isaiah 63, you know, and, and this is like brutally, uh, it's, it's hard for people to even reconcile that. But take this into consideration. Like when we look at uh, Isaiah 61, which we'll look at later, it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then it talks about uh, all the things that he would do. And it says, uh, the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Two kind of things are the day of the, the year of, uh, the year of, acceptance of our Lord. It was talking about the year of Jubilee, which all the restoration of everything anyone has lost is returned to them on the year of Jubilee. That's talking about an end time reward, you know, uh, fulfillment, uh, restoration of everything in the earth that was lost through Adam's sin. Everything is returned. And, and then the day of vengeance of our God. Uh, a lot of people think, well, that's kind of harsh, but you got to take into consideration uh, we look in Revelation, there's all the martyrs that are before the throne saying, how long, O oh Lord, will you wait until you, you avenge the blood you know, of all these people that have been martyred? And when you look at the sin that's taking place on the earth that the Lord is watching, you know, seeing billions of people and participating, and there's, there's sex trafficking, there's child molestation, there's, there's all of these horrific things that are taking, and there's going to be people that are actually unrepentant at the end of the age like this. And the Lord says he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So he's very patient in waiting uh, for people to come to know him and to repent. But there'll come a time when they're unrepentant, and we can see that when we get into Revelation. It says they would no longer repent. That's, that happens before the Lord ever pours out bowls of wrath on the earth. They would no longer repent. And when we get to that kind of uh, hardness of heart and that kind of defiance of God, There'll come a time when there'll be cheers from you if you're a righteous person. When the Lord comes and finally vindicates and puts an end to the just the, uh, the ruthless, sinful degradation that goes on with people. When they, when they go and they, they're, you know, this child molestation, sexual trafficking, all that kind of stuff. When that finally, people are finally held accountable and they're unrepentant. Uh, I think they'll actually be rejoicing that the wicked are crushed. Now that's, that's rough talk and that's not very politically correct and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying, it's very likely that a lot of these passages, where it even says the Lord rides on the clouds 
and he comes through the desert and he, he comes and he, he, he destroys the, the kings of the earth that are defying him, that those are actually not just, uh, you know, allegorical, metaphorical, big flowery statements about how powerful the Lord is. They may actually be literal uh, declarations, prophetic declarations of what he's going to do when he returns, when he sets up his kingdom and those things that are, uh, uh, those ones that are totally uh, opposed to him. So I wanted to bring that up because I just passed over that quickly through the Psalms, but um, there are declarations throughout the Bible that are speaking time and time again about this, this central theme of the Lord's return and the setting up of his kingdom. Even when John the Baptist came and when Jesus came, the, their first message was the kingdom of God. And it, as we'll look in the New Testament, it's, it's manifested in a couple different ways. There's a present kingdom of God that they brought with them. There's a future kingdom of God when he establishes his, his uh, rule and reign from Jerusalem. Okay, that was a lot, but I'm trying to catch up on some stuff that we kind of passed over. Um, another thing I want to do is go back to a couple of passages, and this may be really hard for some people because these are kind of pet passages that people have used in the past. But I want to look at once again, Bible interpretation and how we look at the scriptures. In Psalm 107, there's a real uh, commonly quoted passage. And I don't want you to be upset. You can, you, can, you can use this passage the way you've always used it if you want to, and it's fine. It says this, though. It says, uh, verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting, or his mercy, his hesed, is forever. Uh, that's the most commonly, uh, that's the most common scripture in all of the Bible. That's repeated more times than any other thing. Uh, for his mercy is forever. And then the next verse too, so says, well, go back to one. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. Okay, most people just take that second verse, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And uh, we've had songs even sung, little ditties, and they go, you know, say so, say so. You know, the Lord doesn't want us to walk around saying so, so. It's, what he wants us to do is do what the first verse said. Praise the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy is forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say that, what we just said. So, you know, you can go around and say you're redeemed, and that's wonderful. It is wonderful, and you should do that. But really, the context of the verse is the, is the declaration of the Lord's goodness, not so much of your re redemption, but of his goodness in connection with your redemption. If you're redeemed, you should be saying the Lord is good. So here's an easy way out if you just want to talk about the Lord and any time someone comes and talks to you, you can say, hey, you know, the Lord is good. His mercy is forever. He told us to do that. And so he told us to do it on a regular basis. So uh, I'm not saying don't say, don't say you're not uh, redeemed, but I'm saying... The declaration in context of that voice, uh, verse, when we're studying how you actually interpret a verse, uh, that one's referring, the let the redeemed of the Lord say so, is referring back to the first verse, which is saying, praise the Lord for he's good, you know, uh, for his mercy is forever. Another one like that, which just gets a little more sensitive, Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we have a lot of people quote, this is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And they're talking about today. And it is a day the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. But in the context of this passage here, what it's, there's a bigger truth, actually a more glorious truth, that's talked about here. It says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. What is that talking about? It's talking about Jesus, the Messiah who came in the future, was rejected by the builders. But he's become the chief cornerstone. He says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So what day is it that that's referring to in its context? If we're studying the Bible in its context, the day it's referring to is the day that Jesus was rejected by the builders but established as the chief cornerstone of this new building that God was putting together, this new body on the earth that includes us if you're redeemed. And so I'm just saying, you can, you can go and say, this is the day the Lord has made and talk about today and how wonderful it is, that's fine. But I'm saying there's a greater meaning in the context of this scripture, which is 
The day that we're really rejoicing in is the day that Jesus bought our redemption, the day that he was rejected by men, but established by God as a chief cornerstone of this new building he's putting together with the church, which includes us.